Judges chapter 12 and and stick your finger there and then flip back to uh, 10. Real quickly, we're going to kind of take a look at that because I think it comes into play with chapter 12. As you turn in there, I, I, I'm reminded lately and even in this chapter that <clears throat> the Lord has put people in our life, uh, leaders in our life, um, who've influenced us along the way. You know, people that have touched our lives and everybody has someone, at least one or two someones come to mind. Uh, those people that have spoke truth in their life, and many times you don't even realize what has happened until much later and you look back and you realize God was just speaking to you through these people. And, and sometimes it's even, you know, you can think of, uh, you maybe think of, of presidents. You may think of, of, you know, leaders. You may think of school teachers, uh, family members, um, Sunday school teachers, uh, people that have, uh, God has used to really sort of form your life and, and form the path that you walk. And, and many times those people are planting seeds along the way. And all the while, God was raising people up and putting them in your path and guiding you along the way. And I can think of, um, I can think of many people along the way. And and uh, and I, I think I've told somebody before about uh, one particular man. I coached his son in t-ball when the boys were playing baseball um, up north, and uh, um, when we lived up there, and. Uh, and I got to be friends with this man, and, and he was uh, 40 something years old, got bone cancer. And I uh, was really kind of freaked out about it because <clears throat> there was, and he always had a smile on his face. He just always had a smile on his face. You go to visit him, and you know, and it was such a new thing to me. And, and as it is most people, hard to visit someone that's sort of in those final days or what appears to be facing something that's, that is going to you know, take their life eventually. And uh, you would go to visit him, and, and you would come out smiling, and he'd just make you smile. He couldn't help it. And uh, I'll never forget that he he's in a hospital gown, you know. And you can only be so happy when you're wearing a hospital gown, right? <laughs> and he's in a hospital gown, and he's hurting. And actually, when he first got cancer, when he first found out he had this, they were lifting him up. He bent over to tie his shoes and broke three ribs. And they found out his bones were just ate up with cancer from head to toe. And they had to be careful when they transferred him, moved him around the hospital because they'd break bones if you lifted him. And he was so brittle. And uh, so he fought all this, and, and he was beating it, and then he got a pneumonia. He ended up dying from pneumonia. But this, this man was sitting in the hospital bed on his, um, with a death sentence on him, and uh, he, he'd, somebody would come into the room and he'd say, he said, I'm going to be all right. I got my lucky rock. And he, he said, you want to see my lucky rock? And he, and he put his hand like he's had a pocket, like he's got a hospital gown. He has got a pocket, you know. <laughs> and he goes, you want to see my lucky rock? And, and, uh, and it was like, well, sure. And he was like, let me tell you about my rock of Jesus Christ in my life. You know, and he'd go into this and he'd tell him, he'd just give testimony about Christ and, and uh, how the Lord had bought him and paid for him and that. Uh, it was all going to be okay, and uh, and he did go home to be with the Lord, and uh, he loved the Lord dearly, and he was a great testimony. And I didn't realize any of that at the time. I was <clears throat> uh, like most people, a little freaked out by it. I was freaked out by it then, uh, such a thing. And uh, it was much later. I look back and think God was using that man to plant seeds and form people's lives and their thinking and. And he was such a prominent part of the sort of the change that began to happen in my life. And, uh, and, and I think about this as God is raising up leaders. We read, read about God raising up leaders. And, and he's raising up leaders. Here, here's really the gist of this whole message. It ain't even started yet. I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> God is raising up leaders for a people that don't know they need lead and and a people that aren't even calling out to God. But he's raising up people to speak truth into their life. And, and, and as we look at that happening around us in the world, the vast majority of people are not paying attention. And they're not crying out for help. And uh, 
That was my ending, so now we can get the message. <laughs> so chapter 10 says, um, verse 6, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord <clears throat> and served the Baals and Ashtoreths and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Sounds like they didn't have time. They were serving all these other things, right? Verse 7, so the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. And so they had cried out to the Lord in this case. The Lord had said, you know what? Why don't you go cry out to your idols? You don't have time for me. Go cry out to your idols. And the Lord, in, in, in their suffering, the Lord moved behind the scenes, and he raises up a, a deliverer for them. And, and this uh, deliverer, uh, Jephthah delivered them from the Ammonites, but it doesn't say anything about the um, Philistines, where verse 10 said that they were given into the hands of the Philistines. And so that brings us to chapter 12, verse 8, was where we left off. Uh, Jephthah had, uh, had just died. He had judged Israel for six years, having delivered them from the Ammonites. And uh, verse 8, then after that, after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons, and he gave away 30 daughters in marriage. And he brought in, to 30, uh, brought in 30 daughters uh, from elsewhere for his sons. He judged uh, Israel seven years, and then Isban died and was buried in Bethlehem. So Ibzan uh, was another one of these. We have these insertion of some of these minor prophets. And... Uh, and Ibzan means uh, splendid. It, 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 one um, uh, Bible dictionary says it means great fatigue at childbirth. This word is a picture of great fatigue at childbirth, but it also means splendid and witness, which is kind of fascinating mix of words to explain a word. Ibzan has this. He was uh, 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 at Bethlehem, but this is not the Bethlehem we're most familiar with. This is uh, Bethlehem up in Zebulon in Galilee. And he had 30 sons, uh, so which probably is a giveaway that he had many wives, had a harem, uh, concubines, uh, and then he uh, gave away uh, 30 uh, daughters in marriage. And so giving away these daughters in marriage is sort of an indication that he was expanding sort of his reach in the, uh, sort of the political realm of these daughters marrying other uh, leaders and uh, into other tribes, maybe, and families in the area. And so where he might have had influence very very closely, he was spreading that influence out through his family. This is typically what you'd see from kings, right, from rulers, not necessarily from judges, because the judge didn't pass from generation to generation like a king might setting up this uh, kingdom. And, and so it, it gives you a little bit of a, uh, feel for they were moving towards this this idea of kings. Verse 11, after him, Elon, which means mighty oak. Uh, so when you look at Elon Musk, you can think of him as the mighty oak. <laughs> after him, Elon, the Zebul Zebulonite, judged Israel. He judged Israel for 10 years, and Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried at uh, Ajalon in the country of Zebulon. And so another one, uh, this mighty oak of a man lives, judges uh, for 10 years and dies. We don't hear the cycle. We don't, we don't hear the failure, the crying out. We aren't shown any of that. So we don't, um, it almost looks like he's, these men were uh, carrying on in between sort of the major um, storylines from, uh, from Jephthah into Samson's life. Uh, verse 13, after him, uh, Abdon, uh, which is a faithful servant, means faithful servant. Uh, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the uh, Pyrethonite uh, from Pyrethon. I had never heard of this, six miles uh, south of Samaria. Uh, he judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. Uh, and so he has the 70 uh, heirs. Looks very much like Gideon. They rode on 70 young donkeys. 
He judged Israel for eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, uh, died and was buried in Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the mountains of the Amalekites. And, and so the faithful servant um, lives, has a large family again, uh, showing great wealth, riding these um, uh, 70 donkeys with great wealth. Um, and, and this is like having a fleet of cars in your garage, right? This was a huge family, uh, all riding donkeys, and it all looks uh, like they're very prominent and this uh, prominence spread out across the area. And so he uh, judged Israel for uh, eight years. Um, the, the note about the Amalekites is interesting. Uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, Amalekites were like this uh, perennial sort of uh, enemy of Israel all through a lot of history. And um, they usually were associated down with the Negev, uh, Amalekites in the Negev region. But it sort of gives you a picture that maybe a little bit more nomadic. They were wandering, and they were uh, in this area of Ephraim that uh, that Abdon was. So it was a kind of an interesting note thrown in on a on a minor prophet, uh, because we get very little details, and then it throws a detail like the Amalekites in there, makes it feel real important. Going on, chapter thirteen. <coughs> Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So it almost feels like with this sentence, this line, it almost feels like this is very sequential that we've looked at these judges. But we looked at chapter 10, and they were under the oppression of the Philistines at that time, and there was no time, place in between where it says they were delivered from the Philistines. And so... so you know, there's some indication that maybe this is a sort of an overlap. This is the same Philistine oppression that was mentioned in 10, and we're looking at a different geographical region. And, and there's some argument that some of these kings were very regional and not necessarily judging the entire uh, nation. And, and so we don't really know, and you can see different speculations of that, but it's worth mentioning um, because the, the Philistines were such a constant enemy and it goes way back um, that the Philistines, and you want to do an interesting study sometime, go look where the Philistines came from, how they landed the, in there, the five cities. And right now the five cities, uh, the Philistines and along the coast, and uh, it's a fascinating study to look at the Philistines and um, follow that through time as far as you can. It's fascinating. And so they fell into the hands of the Philistines that the, the Lord used the Philistines uh, uh, to get their attention for 40 years. 40 years, this is twice as long as any of the, uh, any of the longest oppressions that we've seen before they uh, began to cry. It was twice as long, which the longest had been uh, under Deborah when Deborah and Barak uh, responded, and, uh, which would have been uh, Midianites, I believe. And so uh, twice as long, and it still doesn't say they cried out. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting as we go on. So keep that in mind that, that this oppression has gone on for 40 years. We just saw 25 years with these three minor uh, judges, right? So, so 25 years now you've been under the oppression of the Philistines. This is a lifetime. And you look at these three, first three, and you don't really know the details of what was going on at those days. But those were real men that lived and judged and spoke into people's lives and and resolved uh, uh, the uh, you know the affairs among the people and um, and, and surely they touched and moved, uh, be it good or bad, they they moved in people's lives and even sometimes those bad leaderships or bad advice helps us to form up who we are uh, because we can spot those things that maybe uh, were bad advice in our life or bad form in our. Uh, sort of in our vision and our purview and we say um, that's something I want to take note something that I grow through and, and uh, grow from and it helps to form our values and so these, these three men and then on top of this uh, Philistine oppression this is, a, this is a lifetime and so someone could have grown up until they came to that age of where they would have been uh, you know in their 20s or something and then fall into the Philistine oppression and live their entire life under this oppression. 
And it's fascinating that not nowhere in that person's lifetime would they have heard the nation cry out to God. But they would have seen a nation that was full of idolatry, chasing after other gods, paying no attention to the God that wanted to speak into their life and was calling to them. Yet, with all that going on, you grow up in the culture, you never hear them calling out to God or anything else, yet God is behind the scenes and he's raising up a leader. He's raising up uh, someone to deliver them. He's raising up a deliverer even when they have not called for one and asked God for one. And that God is always behind that scenes and doing a work and working through. Um, another life to touch us, to move us. And uh, so let's go on to verse 2, 13 2. Now there was a certain man from Zorah uh, of the family of Danites, of the Danites, who was, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now uh, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, uh, for the child shall be a Nazarite, a Nazarite uh, to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So there's quite a bit going on there. So uh, uh, Zorah was a 16 miles west of Jerusalem. 16 miles west of Jerusalem would have been where this Zorah is. So you're getting close to, as you go west from Jerusalem, you're approaching what would be known and seen as the a Philistine territory, and, uh, and if they were under oppression, the Philistines would have been making their way farther and farther into Israel's uh, sort of central land and uh, taking more and more of it until they were feeling the oppression of them. And so we don't know how, what that exactly looked like. Um, but this family was, um, and, and it says this certain man was named Manoah. He was from the Danites, so there was, a city, Zora, right down in Judah, uh, had the tribe of Dan was given this city in Judah. And it's kind of interesting. And so he's a, a Danite. Dan, tribe of Dan would have been way up north. Is uh, where normally the Dan tribe of, of tribal land of Dan was. Uh, tongue tied. Uh, so Manoah was from the tribe of Dan. He's in Zora. And, and then his wife was barren. Uh, ladies, this is a great study. The, the ladies who are tearing up this Bible study and loving it. And so this, this, is, your, this is your homework. Um, and and uh, you can take this on if you choose to, but it's an interesting thought anyway. Uh, why, is, uh, why is this woman never given a name? She's considered one of the top 23 by sort of the old rabbinical writings that among the 23 um, uh, truly upright and righteous women in the Bible. She's in the, she's in the 23, this group of 23. Because she's not given a name. She has no name. She's a, she is barren. Uh, Manoah's name is right up front of this man, this certain man. And, and uh, his wife was barren and had no children. The, uh, uh, I think it's the Midrash, actually gives a name for him. So I'll let you look that up. Uh, but the Bible gives no name for this woman. Uh, and and, and as she pr as playing such a prominent role that she does, and you look at this, it really speaks to us. So well, let's go on and we'll think about this a little bit more. So this wife was barren, and she, had, she uh, obviously had no children, and the angel of the Lord appears to her. And he said, indeed, you, uh, you are barren and have uh, uh, born no children, but you're going to conceive and bear a son. So to not have a son, to be barren this way, was a great shame for this woman. I mean, this was a, this was a, 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 a way that the woman was um, seen and offered value to her culture, to her, to her clan, and was to produce, reproduce, to have many children, to raise them up. And, and so this was a, a woman that could not bear children was, one, the, the, 
people would look that that woman is cursed by God. That's why they looked at it. That that God was controlled the womb, and that if you could not deliver children, that there must be you've done something. God is angered, angry with you, and and so she was always had to be under this sort of um, her own oppression within her life of feeling this constant pressure that she couldn't deliver and this desire to have a child so much and and I, I can't even you know I don't think we can begin to imagine what that felt like to her and then the angel of the Lord comes and says you're going to have a child this is the greatest news ever this is she had to be bubbling over right now right she had to just be so excited that this angel and she doesn't know this is an angel um at all. She just, this man shows up and says, you're going to conceive and bear a son. And so I think she probably thought this was a prophet speaking into her life. And then, and then he goes on, he says, but you have to be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, not to eat anything unclean. So this is part of the Nazarite uh, vow, right? That you don't drink uh, wine or drink, they don't eat anything unclean. And, and no razor would come up upon your head. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, so you can see this described. Uh, you can go back to number six, and you can see the first time this Nazarite vow is sort of detailed out in number six. And, and it says uh, fruit of the vine. And so that would be like grapes and other things that would come off the vine, but it could also be even like raisins or anything. And so the, the one sort of view of that is saying that that's probably talking about anything that can ferment. And so anything that could ferment and have alcohol, and that's what you're trying to avoid. And, and so you can see it defined that way. But there's a lot of indication that that fruit of the vine and that stuff, even if it wasn't fermented, may have been used in pagan worship. All the, all the idolatry that was going on around them and all of the other gods that they were worshiping that this was part of how they would worship and that they would, you know, worship these trees, these vines, to you know, they did a lot of strange things. And while this was a staple of the diet, uh, an obvious staple of the diet in that time, this is almost like it's a lifetime of fasting from this. It says, my life is committed in such a way that I would not um, take part in this. Eating anything unclean then, uh, you see that played out in um, more of staying clear of anything dead, uh, any dead bodies or anything like that. And so there's a couple different ways that is viewed. Um, also, um, it's an uncleanness that is achieved by going near something dead. That is kind of how it's defined in number six. Um, and, and again, this may be a positioning in uh, Manoah's time and his wife's time against this sort of cult of the dead, which was very prominent uh, within the pagan uh, sort of rituals and, and cults around them, uh, that they would uh, mourn the dead, they would try to contact the dead, they would worship ancestors uh, within their family, and, uh, uh, and all this was done sort of in this uh, community setting of ancestry worship. And so by uh, restricting... A, if you look back at number six, it says you won't even, you would not even, as a, under a Nazarite vow, you wouldn't even go near and mourn the loss of your parents or your brothers or sisters or anything like that, that you would keep your distance from that. And so it is almost this view of keeping your distance from anything where that pagan culture may be coming in that's influenced this, um, this idolatry and these kinds of things. Uh, the same can be said about the hair of your head. We, we know that there's passages in talking about uh, harvesting the hair. It's uh, shaving your head for uh, the dead, shaving your head for uh, purposes of worshiping other gods. And so they would make marks, they would shave their head, they would take hair. And uh, hair was seen much like blood. Uh, blood is used for a sacrifice and for worship. They would use hair the same way and uh, represent it as a sort of that life force, that life essence in, in hair. And so by saying, hey, this, your hair would never be cut, it would never be touched, was to show that this is, I have never cut my hair and used it in worship of another, of another God in any way. And so it was a way as a Nazarite of setting himself apart from all this junk that was going 
uh, on around them. The differences, there's big differences in this, though. Uh, the biggest is that it's divinely imposed. Normally, a Nazarite vow was a person voluntarily said, I want to take this Nazarite vow. I just feel like God has just called me to do this. He's done a great work in my life. I want to take this Nazarite vow. I want to live in this sort of under this vow for some period of time, which was arbitrary. You decided it, you and, and the Lord. And at the end of that, there was sort of this um, sort of ritual type stuff that you would go and, and that you would, t- you would cut your hair, you would bring an offering before the Lord and so forth, and, and you would complete your vow before the Lord. I think that's what Paul was doing um, in that you can read about in, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, so this was a divinely uh, uh, imposed, and it was done for a whole life, which is pretty incredible. And, and so this, it's kind of this picture of, um, uh, of, of setting him aside, but also at the, the end of it, you always brought this offering and, and ended this vow. Well, it, it appears that his life becomes that offering, that his entire life was set apart, set aside, and that his very life had become that offering. So God is raising up a man uh, very different that um, was to play this role that was uh, ordained by God in in every way, and it's an odd that plays out in an odd way, and we get to study that in the coming weeks. Um, this vow would go into effect at the moment of conception, and, and as such, then, that obligates mom um, to observe these terms of the Nazarite vow until he is born. But she had to keep these things also while he was in a ro- in her womb. It's kind of interesting. That's an unusual way this vow plays out also. And uh, I think I mentioned it, that just the term of the, of the vow was for his whole life. And so that's uh, angel comes to Manoah's wife. She deserves a name by now, you know. You go, the Manoah's wife. She just feels like she deserves a name. And, and I think that namelessness is a uh, uh, shows the uh, what her life was like. That even to her husband, she had no name. That she was not prominent. That she was sort of looked down on. And I think we see that play out a little bit. Verse 6, so the woman came and she told her husband, saying, a man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of it of the angel of God. Very awesome. Which is kind of cool. He's like, how do you know what an angel of God's countenance looks like? But she has this in her mind, and she says, man, he was like an angel, and uh, he was very awesome. But I didn't ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. I think this is a woman that's paying attention because she knew this guy's important and listening is a little bit more important than asking questions. And, and she was probably very excited and probably in awe where we'll find that knowing his name and where he was from was much more important to Manoah. But she says, she, she defends herself. So I didn't ask, I didn't, I and mean, he didn't tell me. Uh, he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Uh, now drink no wine, similar drink, nor eat any uh, thing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite uh, to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now notice back in verse 5, this angel says to her that um, he's going to be a Nazarite for, from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. This is, this is why he's being raised up. He's going to be a Nazarite. Can you imagine mom hearing this? Her life is... Her life has had, in, in, in the culture's eyes, her life has had no value. She's just going through the motions of life. She's had no values. She cannot uh, bear a child, and, and she is bearing that burden. And suddenly that burden is going to be removed. Not only that, but we're going to set this life that's coming in your womb apart. He's going to be the deliverer from the Philistines. That had to be... That had to stir her. She, she doesn't tell her husband that. She doesn't tell him that he, he's going to be this deliverer. It just says that he's, she was given these instructions on Nazarite vow. 
And I think it's fascinating that she holds that information back. Knowledge is power. And uh, something to think about. Put that on the list, ladies. Why would she not tell her husband? We, maybe we get a little hint as we go on. I, I want to come to this lady study and talk about this more. <laughs> then Manoah prayed to the, to the Lord and said, uh, Oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent uh, come to us again and teach us what we shall do for this child um, who will be born. This is Manoah going, Woman, I'm not sure I really believe you. And this is, uh, this is like putting down his own little fleece, right? This is like getting his fleece. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. I need some confirmation. And so he calls out and prays to the Lord. He says, come and talk to me this time. You know, come and you know, fill, fill us in you know, a little bit more on what we should do. Verse 9, and God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel uh, of God came to the woman. Again, Manoah's like, no, you're supposed to come to me. I think he was offended. I think he's like, I think he is so was so used to looking at his barren wife as having no value. He couldn't imagine why a man of God would come to his wife and not come to him. I think he saw himself as this prominent role in the family. And God loves to do this, right? All through the Bible, you see God takes the lesser, the least, the, and, he, and he works through those people. And she's got to be smiling, you know. This, this man of God, this angel, comes back to, to the woman again. God listens to the voice of Manoah. The angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Verse 10, the woman ran in haste, told her husband, and said to him, Look, the man of, uh, who came to me the other day, um, has just now appeared to me again. Um, so Manoah rose and, and he followed his wife. I love that line. I think that's pretty cool. And she had never, you know, it's just one of those lines. She had never played a role where her husband followed her. She followed her husband. Manoah rose, followed his wife. And he, we came to the man. We see God's building value up in this woman. And he said to, to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? Like, no, no, she has a name. <laughs> Are you the man who spoke to this woman? Are you the man that came to my wife two times now and not me? You can sort of see his lack of respect. You see he's sort of incredulous and and, and, and almost maybe a little on the snarky side. Um, he, he feels like she didn't get all the information that he needs. And so instead of uh, asking her, or assuming that she's got everything that's going to be given, he says, I'm gonna, I need to go back to this man and get the real story from him because he didn't trust her story. And uh, I think it's a very telling uh, attitude. And it's not... It, and it's not speaking as, as Moreau is some evil man. I, I don't mean that. But this is the way the culture lived. This is sort of, this was normal. And, and in a, a, um, a time when um, the people had turned their back so far from God under the oppression of the Philistines for 40 years, and that, that they don't even think crying out to God is the right way to go. Um, it's kind of telling of, uh, of an attitude of, a, of an unbelieving culture. Lost my place. Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Which I really like that, the way that. The am part is actually uh, italicized. It's not really in the original text. It's in there. It makes sense. Which the original text would just be, it would have been an I, as in a yes, or yep, it's me. Yep, it's me. Verse 12, Manoah said, <clears throat> Now let your words come to pass, that um, what will be the boy's rule of life in his work? And, and what he's asking is like, why are you here? What is this all about? What is the, sort of the, what is the end game? If this, 
child's going to be born and my barren wife and my, I pray that that is all true and that's all going to come to pass. And Where's his life going? What's, uh, what is the sort of the overarching authoritative idea that's going to inform the path to his life? What is the, where's this path going to go? What's going to guide that path and what does it end? This is kind of what he's asking. Well, he had told her, right? that through this man I'm going to begin to deliver Israel. But he doesn't know this. So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, uh, let her be careful, that she may not eat anything that comes from the vine, uh, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Which is kind of like Manoah, go talk to your wife. I already told her. That's pretty cool. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please uh, let us detain you while we prepare a a young goat for you. This is a a normal cultural thing too of hospitality. A stranger comes in that uh, it would be very rude of you not to prepare a meal for them and invite them to come and stay and share a meal with you. And so that's all this is, is is, a... um, he wants to detain this person to come and share a meal with them at their table. And uh, verse 16, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, uh, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But, uh, but if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. So again, Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. In verse 17, then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. I think it's fascinating that the name of this messenger comes into play when the name of his wife is never mentioned. What a contrast that to Manoah, we don't don't give him this woman's name and she's going to play this prominent role as a deliverer, bringing a child is going to be a deliverer from the Philistines. And he wants to know the name of, of this messenger. And, and in the culture to, to, to have someone's name, especially pagan culture particularly, you know, to, to be able to name that name was to have authority over that person's life. And so sort of in the pagan uh, sort of rituals and magic and all that weirdness, was they, they thought if you know you knew your na- their name, then you can manipulate their life through all this sort of ritual stuff. And so you don't know if that's what's pl- at play here, but just sort of this general understanding of I, I seek your name uh, to to give you praise uh, when this um, comes to be uh, to honor you. Again, he's not knowing that he's talking to an angel of the Lord. So this, this name part is fascinating to me. Verse 18, and the angel of the Lord said to him, uh, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? The only, this word is used all over the Old Testament. Wonder, this word wonderful. And in every case, it is talking about God. Every case. It is talking about a God in a, in a way that man, it's, his, this wonderful is, is to say, you can't comprehend my name. You can't comprehend how wonderful God is. You cannot, our, our puny minds can't encapsulate what kind of wonderful this is. Let's look at one time. Let's look at one of the usages of this word. Go to Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's that wonderful. It's right there in Isaiah 9, 6. And not only is he talking about God, but in this case it is talking specifically 
and understood to be the Messiah, that, that this one would come, that he would be wonderful, that he would be counselor and mighty in a way that cannot be comprehended, totally and completely comprehended by the human mind. And so the angel of the Lord says to him, why would you, why do you seek my name seeing it is, it is wonderful? The name was often used for sort of vain things to control, to manipulate, to, um, to slander even by name. And, and the angel of the Lord would not expose his name to whatever it was but Noah would offer or would do with his name. I think that's interesting. He protected his name. His name was power. His name was mighty. His name was important. We know his name is Jesus. Verse 19. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and he offered it upon the rock of the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. A wondrous thing. A wondrous thing. This wondrous thing is another form of that same word up in verse 18, the wonderful. His name is wonderful, and he does a wondrous thing. It's a, it's a different form of the same word. He did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. Verse 20. It happened as the flame went up towards heaven from the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. What a moment. <laughs> he thinks he's, he's preparing a meal. He wants to prepare a meal and still not understanding that this messenger, who this messenger is. And he brings the meal then instead. He brings his goat instead and puts it as a, as a sacrifice on the rock. And, and, and then flame comes up. The sacrifice and the smoke, the fire of the sacrifice ascends to heaven and the angel of the Lord hitches a ride on the fire. I wonder how fast that was. It's like, <laughs> go on. And his wife said, see, I told you. <laughs> and, uh, what a moment. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. The whole thing became very clear at that moment. They fell on their faces to the ground. The proper, the proper way to worship, to acknowledge who he was. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife than Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. See, this is the understanding. If you, if you see God, you're going to die. And so you can't, you, can't, you can't see God. He's like, oh no, we've seen God. We're going to die. And Manoah's wife says, if the Lord had desired to kill us, um, he would not have accepted the burnt offering and the grain offering from our hands. He would nor would he have shown us all of these things, and nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. Manoah is overwhelmed, face down, yelling, we're going to die. And his wife says, get up. He said, I'm going to have a baby. And that cool thing is going to happen in our life. If he wanted to kill us, we'd have been killed. And she sees this clearly, that that was the acceptance of the burnt offering, and that he's spoken into our lives. That God has brought someone into our life to speak into our life, and she knew the purpose behind it. God's bringing a deliverer. God's bringing somebody to change what's going on in our culture. God is bringing us hope. God brought her hope first. But her hope would bring hope to the entire culture, to the, all of the land, right? So the woman bore a son. 
and she called his name Samson. Name means sunlight. She bore a son and she that was her, her little sunlight. Her little sunlight. And many of the uh, Bible scholars don't like that name because they worship the sun and so many of these other cultures. But he was going to be a different kind of light in the world. And uh, he was going to bring a light through the hand of God. Even though he's not a perfect man by a long shot, God was going to use him. You know, I just bless him in this woman again that this nameless, he remains nameless, and yet keep bringing that up. She bore a son and she called his name. And his name's important enough to be recorded. His name is Samson. He's a sunlight. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. The Mahana Dan. Between Zora and Eshtel. Zora and Eshtel was a mile apart. And right between them was a, a spring, a wadi, a um, sort of an oasis, we might think of it. Right between those two cities. And, and they think that must be the camp. The, the Mahane Dan is a camp of Dan. <clears throat> and so there must have been a, a location of some of the tribes of Dan or the um, families of Dan in that area. And so the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him there at this place. And uh, as we see her bear this child and begin to as he is raised up, he begins to, the Lord preparing him for what he is about to do. So we see the Lord was raising up this uh, Savior to the people. So that the people that didn't have the sense to call out to God from their oppression. So you, why didn't they call out to God? You know, one, you go, they, they no longer recognized the oppression they were under. It just became normal to them. Some never knew any other normal, right? What we talked about before, you grew up under this oppression. This was normal. That's all they knew. And therefore, they, know, they did not cry out to the Lord because they, no, they didn't know anything else. They become comfortable in their idolatry and all the consequences of it. And I think God had become clearer previously when they when they cried out to him, they don't cry out to me unless you cry out in repentance. Otherwise, just go talk to your other, your God. And I look at that and I think of how that fits into this. And, and I, honestly, I think they saw, and I think this speaks to, to us today and to our culture. They saw giving up their sin as a greater suffering than the oppression that they were under. Does that make sense? They were so attached to their sin and so enjoyed their sin because it pleased their flesh today and now. They couldn't imagine giving up their sin for a state that they could not comprehend and could not see. For deliverance from the oppression that they called normal. However, the Lord was preparing Samson for a coming time and a day. I shared earlier, I, wasn't, I didn't really have this in my notes. I don't know what time it is. I've got time. Um, I helped a, a young couple yesterday, and, and uh, part of that was I um, spoke to him about the Lord, told him about Jesus. And uh, he threw up some walls, gave reasons why he didn't go to church, why he didn't. The same ones you hear repeatedly. And so I was speaking into that a little bit and uh, talked about the need of Jesus and how important it was in the time and the days we're living in. And, and uh, the next thing out of his mouth, absolutely stunned me. I really was just 
really felt like I was trying to speak into his life, and it was a divine appointment. I go, it was way out of my way to come talk to this man. And he looked up, and he said, do you know anything about mufflers? <laughs> you talk about throwing a wall up. It was so sad, such a sad moment. But he is so far from the Lord that he could not even begin to imagine um, the peace and the joy and the, and the, uh, of deliverance. And, and uh, he had to get away from it. He's feeling the pressure. And even in that, it's very much an indication that it was uh, moving and stirring him and the Holy Spirit was doing work, right? And uh, so uh, I, I think that's more normal than it ought to be. I think that's just what our world looks like of, of people that are under oppression of sin but no longer recognize it as oppression. That the leaders within that call that progressiveness and with normalized the sin and the idea of Repenting and turning away from that sin is unheard of. And uh, only God can do that. And God can do that. Don't, don't dismiss that. God can deliver from those circumstances. And praise God, our Lord has a name. And the fact that this woman did not have a name makes her even more prominent in my eyes. This is so important. Let's pray.